and welcome to Kapoor with the Scientists, a podcast by Loughborough University that will interview a different scientist each week about their academic journey to the top. We will discuss how they went from a confused teenager choosing A-level subjects to a leader in their field, with plenty of weird and wonderful stories in between and golden nuggets of advice for those aspiring to get into science. As well as keeping your ears and brain entertained, we hope this podcast will dispel the myth that all scientists wear white lab coats and give you an insight into how vast the world of science really is. And because the makers of this show are painfully British, we'll be doing it all over a good cuppa. Before we get started, a quick bit about your host. I'm Meg and I'm a PR and communications officer at Loughborough University and I'm also an aspiring scientist. I made the tough decision to return to university last year to pursue my love of biology and I found podcasts to be an incredibly helpful resource when making that decision. They're slightly field specific, so specifically one on physics and another on marine biology. From health sciences to social sciences, we'll cover it all in this podcast and show you how vast science really is. And hopefully you'll pick up a few tips and tricks along the way to help you on your journey to becoming a scientist. So stick the kettle on and get settled in. Joining us for today's episode is Professor Barry Bogan, an Emeritus Professor of Biological Anthropology in the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences. US born Barry is an expert in human evolution theory and his main research areas are the evolutionary origins of human childhood and physical growth in Guatemalan Maya children. He has his own Wikipedia page, which states he is notable for arguing that human evolution introduced two new pre-reproductive stages, childhood and adolescence, into development. And this is biologically specific to humans. Barry is also the author of a book titled Patterns of Human Growth, and he has also been interviewed by journalists from around the globe for the likes of New Scientist, the BBC and the New York Times. But more on all of that later. Um, so hi Barry, welcome to the show. Um, first of all, important question, what mug have you gone for and what are you drinking? Well, what I've gone for is my Cycling UK mug. Cycling UK is the national bicycle charity that works for the interests of bicyclists throughout the UK, as the name says. And this mug tells us, I don't know if you can see it, it tells us how not to get too close to a bicyclist when you're passing. So it starts with a little bit of information from the trains. No, you're too close to the edge, mate. You're still too close. Now you're okay. And it keeps going and it says, no, you're passing too close to me, mate. The law says you have to give me five feet. You're still too close. That's only about three feet. Now you're far enough away. So, Think about that next time you're passing a bicyclist. I'm assuming you're driving, you, um... you're driving two tons of steel and plastic. I'm on a lightweight carbon fiber bike. Just touch me and I'm gone. <laughs> so please give us five feet of clearance, a meter and a half. So I assume you're uh, even avid cyclist yourself? Oh, yes. I try to go cycling three, four times a week. Cool. Well, we'll definitely touch on that later when we discuss what, what sure. hobbies you've got. Um, just to showcase my mug, um, so entomology themed, we've got some bugs. I actually painted this myself. <laughs> Fantastic. Did, These did are you... stencils, I can't take full credit. But I've never wow. seen a mug with a grasshopper on it, so yeah, I wanted you... to make one myself. So yeah. not, as, um, not as good as yours when it comes to raising awareness, but fun. No, no, no. <laughs> so we'll be take... aware of the creatures all around us. It's absolutely. Whether they're, they're grasshoppers or cyclists. We need to be aware of all <laughs> creatures, great and small. Lovely, perfectly said. Um, and we've also requested that you bring an artifact with you today. Could you show us what you've got and tell us a bit about you know, it, please? I thought a lot about that. And what I brought, this is going to take a little time to explain. What I brought is a gift that a couple of students gave me a long time ago when I was working at University of Michigan. I had a couple of students who were the first in their family to ever attend uni. And they were kind of scared about it. They thought, you know, everybody's going to be smarter than they were. And, but I figured out pretty quickly that they were the two smartest ones <laughs> in the class. And they, they, they sort of concentrated in me <laughs> more than anthropology. We got along very well. And um, I would teach classes in human evolution. So on the top, there are little skeletons and bones. Wow. And there's a kind of footprint here. And I would teach classes about non-human primates, monkeys and apes. So there's a kind of King Kong figure here. <laughs> okay. And I would also teach about human growth. 
and they 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 made this. They pasted it on a little baby right here in the midst of all the bones and and King Kong. And there's 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 some skulls on there. And inside they put this tooth. They said they didn't know what kind of tooth this is. Can, I don't know how well you can see. Yeah, it's a that. it's a big tooth. It's a very big tooth. <laughs> if it were to fit in my mouth and go way back here, it's some sort of very large carnivore. Now, whether it's a lion or a leopard or a tiger's tooth, they said they found it in a shop and the shopkeeper didn't know what kind of animal it came from. But um, I know that it's a molar tooth from the roots um, and uh, it's, it's, if you open up your dog's mouth, a cat's mouth, you'll see a tooth like this, but a lot smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got a big dog, but not that big. <laughs> yeah, no, no. This is definitely a large carnivore of some sort. And they put that in. And I've had this since the 19, um, like 1985. That's brilliant. I think that's one of my favorite artifacts today. I think that's really cool. Yeah, so it, it sums up everything I do. Thank you for showing us that. Um, so let's get stuck into the questions. Um, so you're an expert in biological anthropology. Could you explain what that entails, please? Yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like that word expert <laughs> unless I'm being paid to give testimony in a court <laughs> of law, which has only happened to me once in my life, then I'll be an expert witness. But um, I'm a student, I'm a student of anthropology. I'm still studying and learning. I just may be a few decades ahead of people who are just starting out. But yeah, biological anthropology. And really, really, I like to call myself an anthropologist. I'm wearing my jumper, or we call it sweatshirts in the US, that the students made at University of Michigan, uh, Dearborn, the Anthropology Club. And it says Michigan Anthropology. And in the center there is a very famous drawing by a, um, an anatomist about 400 years ago, uh, a man who called himself Vesalius. He used a Latin name, Vesalius. And Vesalius's drawings of anatomy were some of the first, very accurate, but also he placed the skeletons in, you know, human positions. Here's a guy uh, contemplating uh, a skull on the table. But it was to show not just the bones, but the, 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 the postures and behaviors that the bones could take. So Vesalius uh, uh, is an inspiration to us all. Anyway, uh, I consider myself an anthropologist. Anthropology, anthropologists study the origins and diversity of human beings throughout time, throughout place today. And um, we look at cultural factors like families, how do people form families, marriage, kinship, how are we all related? What names do we call each other? Kinship names, that is, not bad names. Uh, <laughs> kinship names, you know, who do you call mother and father in different cultures? Sometimes the woman that we would call our aunt, our mother's sister, in places like Hawaii, people call her a mother. And she has the responsibilities of a mother to you, even though she's not your biological mother. Mm -hmm. So I cover this ground between human social behavior, the cultural behavior, and also the biological. I'm interested in how people's bodies work and operate. So you've said you're still a student of this, um, which yeah. leads nicely onto the next question. Um, first of all, is, have we learned all there is to know about human development? Ooh, and no. if not, why is it such an important area of study and that we continue to study it? No. Um, People inspired by Vesalius in anatomy were really the first biological anthropologists. They really studied human, um, human anatomy, how we were put together. And how we get put together is partly how we grow up. We all start out life the same way. We are a fertilized cell, part from our mother, part from our father. And um, most of the parts actually come from our mother. <laughs> but uh, from that, we become trillions of cells that we are today. And it takes human beings, you know, 20 years, more or less, to grow up, physically grow up to our full adult size. Maybe we never grow up socially, <laughs> but we grow up physically. And during that long time, 
lots of things can happen depending on the kind of world we live in, the kind of families we have, the kind of love we get or don't get. So uh, we're still learning how all those things influence human development. That's a really good answer. Um, so say you go to a dinner party and you introduce yourself and your title. Do you find there are any common misconceptions around what you do and what you study? Well, yeah, you know, I read ahead in your script and I know you're going to ask me about the weirdest things. That <laughs> uh, we can talk about that now, but yeah. Okay, yeah, let's go for it. Uh, very often when I say I'm an anthropologist, people really don't understand what that is. Um, and it, it, if they uh, if they have a mild, under, some people know exactly and, and are, you know, there's people out there who are, you know, anthropologists themselves and love non-human primates and love monkeys and apes behavior and love other stuff. But most people think I'm an archeologist. When I say anthropologist, mm -hmm. they think that I dig up stuff, you know, in the past or I find um, uh, ancient buildings or sometimes skeletons. They think that's what they think uh, most often. And I'm not that at all. I have done a little bit of archeology span in my life, but very little. Uh, mostly I deal with the living. And um, the weirdest thing I have to deal with is when I explain what I do and, they, and, and people say, well, why would that be important? Like your, your question, that, your question wasn't weird, but sometimes people assume that um, we know everything and, uh, and well, it, I sh if I'm interested in the way boys and girls grow up, that, isn't that pediatrics? Wouldn't that be a doctor, a medical doctor? And I say, no, they look at diseases and I look at healthy people or, you know, not, hopefully non-diseased people. What's, what's the normal way to grow up? And it takes a while to explain that. We can come back to that later. There's some people get, get even weirder. <laughs> Yeah, looking forward to the segment about your weird stories. That's great. Um, so we'll discuss, like I said, more about your research and the applications of your sure. work later. Um, but let's take it back a little bit first. So I like to learn about how people got to where they are today, how oh. we've got to Professor at Loughborough University. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, I can't imagine as a child that you, your end goal was to be a biological anthropologist. Am I correct? Or did you have another career path in mind? No, I did not really think about anthropology until I was already in university. What I thought about was biology. Okay. I, I loved, I, I, I was born in Philadelphia on the east coast of the United States. Look on a map, it's, a, it's about 100 miles south of New York City. And um, when I was five years old, my parents moved out of the not center city, but older areas of the city to a new uh, area, new uh, housing tract right at the edge of the city. It was still a lot of farmland there. And I loved just going out and seeing the world, like this time of year, spring, seeing the world come alive again. Uh, back then, I mean, now, now it's all built over, but back then there was farmland, there were streams, little ponds, um, a little later in the season, you know, the tadpoles became frogs. The ground was just covered with little baby frogs. There were fish. I, I just loved that stuff. I would turn over rocks to see what was living underneath them. I just loved biology. And my mother, I guess, figured some of that out. I must have talked about it when I came home. And she subscribed me to a series of books. Uh, one would come every month about science. And I just love, I, I, when those books arrived in the mail, I would spend I would just go page by page, not reading them, just going page by page, seeing what was on every page. Some of them were more technology, some were about space exploration. This is, this is back in the 1950s. <laughs> so it was, it was more like um, science fiction back then than reality, and more like you know 1930s Buck Rogers spaceships. But I just loved that stuff. I loved the biology. Everything that came in those books were just great. So, in, in high school, I just gravitated more towards the sciences, especially biology, and I did well there and made friends uh, <laughs> who were also interested in biology, and um, then started university, and I uh, concentrated in biology, traditional biology, not anthropology. 
but I ran into some things I had never thought about. Organic chemistry. I didn't get that in high school, really. I got sort of physical chemistry and calculus. And I, I just, I wasn't prepared for those things. It wasn't that I didn't understand them. I just wasn't, I didn't know what they were all about. I really didn't do very well in those things. And I was not very happy with a lot of things going on in the first couple of years at university. And I also was, a, my parents did not go to university. So I was the first, um, one of my, my mother's sister went to university and one of my father's sisters went, but I was, you know, one of the first to go. And so I didn't get a lot of, it's not, I got a lot of support, but I didn't, my parents didn't mm. know how to react to, to, to things. And uh, I was a little bit lost. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, in the United States, undergraduate programs are four years, not, not the three in the mm -hmm. UK, four years. In my third year, I was just totally lost and doing poorly in everything, even the biology I loved. And I went to the bookstore at the university in Philadelphia, and I was looking through different courses, you know, the books on the shelves. But I found a book called Anthropology A to Z, a little kind of encyclopedia that said, oh, you can do all this biology. You can study non-human monkeys, apes. You can study skeletons. You can study the way kids grow up. And you don't have to take any calculus. <laughs> yes. Now, the, joke, the joke is that, in fact, you do have to take calculus because a lot of the way we grow up is described through mathematical models. Oh, yeah. But I learned about that later. <laughs> now I do trigonometry and calculus, but I didn't understand why you needed to do it so many years ago. Anyway, and um, I, that summer, I took some summer school courses in anthropology, sort of introductory courses. And I just loved it. And my life turned around. So that by the end of my fourth year, I needed six more hours of anthropology to, to get a degree in that. And I managed to get onto a field school program. One of my professors was going to Ecuador in South America, and I had no idea what he was going to do, but I said, I'll go. <laughs> All I had to do was come up with the airfare. My parents, who did support me, you know, gave me the money for the airfare, and I went to Ecuador in South America, and that was my first field experience. I got my master's out of it. Uh, it was a study of how people use plants. My professor was interested in that, and I went around with a couple of people and said, how do you use this plant? How do you use that plant? And, and my master's thesis came out of that. I never worked on that topic again, how people <laughs> use plants, uh, because I then uh, moved into another program and, and one of the professors was studying human growth and I found that more fascinating. So I switched. But um, I think about those times in Ecuador. I think about how that turned my life around and how, how I saw how people's culture, how uh, these were mostly very poor people that I was working with um, uh, right on the coast of Ecuador, on the Pacific coast of South America, and just how their lives were affected by so many small things that I never thought about. Mm. And it all just came together. And I had some archeology span there as well. I've met a couple of archeologists and I even um, ended up with some bones from Ecuador. <laughs> <laughs> that I uh, wrote, a, I wrote a little paper about some of the bones, but eventually those bones went to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. It turned out that they were important, nine thousand year old bones. Wow! <laughs> wow! The archaeologist digging them up didn't realize how important they were. So, uh, so they're probably still in Washington now. <laughs> I think that's absolutely wonderful. The fact you stumbled across a book and, you know, it's led you to be a professor in this topic. Yeah. And I think it's a great example for people that are unsure about their degree and the applications of it to kind of just trust the process. You'll figure it out and you'll right. end up in the right place. So what I, what I tell students today is, you know, trust your heart. I really should have, you know, trusted my heart. Even in, in, in high school, I did go to my high school guidance counselor and, and I, even then, like most people today, I said, I'm kind of interested in anthropology. And she said, I didn't, I don't think I said anthropology. I said, I, I, I said things about anthropology because I really didn't know what it was. But she said, oh, you're talking about archaeology. And, <laughs> and, and I said, no, I'm not. And, and she said, well, you won't get into any universities that offer archaeology. 
And I, I thought I was too stupid. I thought that's what she was telling me. But actually, there's a few, I, I told her that I was going to go to school in Philadelphia for various reasons. And there's a couple of universities there. I went to Temple University, which in many ways is like Loughborough. Um, uh, but there's also University of Pennsylvania, which is one of the elite universities in the United States, like Harvard and Yale. Mm. And uh, she was really telling me I couldn't get into University of Pennsylvania, mainly because she had a few favors she was going to try to get in. They have very high, you know, very, mm. they're very selective, like Oxbridge universities here. So she was telling me, don't try to get in because I don't want you to do it. I have my favorites. <laughs> I wasn't one of her favorites. That's what I think now. But uh, who knows? Anyway, I went to Temple University. They have a very good anthropology program. I was one of the first people to get a PhD in that anthropology program. I think I was, wow. a, I would think I was the third to get a PhD. So that's really cool. So thank you, Temple. <laughs> Big up Temple. You didn't want to go to the other ones anyway. Yeah. Um, so how did we get to where we are today? How have you gone from Temple University to professor well, at Loughborough University? Well, when I, I finished my PhD and I just applied for jobs everywhere um about 11 jobs only got one interview at a place called wayne state university in detroit and that was because i did take two classes with a professor at university of pennsylvania a person named alan mann who's since retired uh, but he went to school with a professor who was at wayne state university they were postgrad students together and when i applied there i i put Professor Mann's name is a reference. And so the professor at Wayne State University, so the name, Professor Weiss, saw that and he probably called his friend and the guy said, yeah, he's okay. <laughs> and I got an interview and it was my experience in Ecuador and in Guatemala that got me the job. I was the only biological anthropologist who had done field work. The other people applying mm. for the job had were like laboratory people. They had never been to the field. So the social anthropologists, archaeologists, linguists, anthropology studies those things, language, archaeology, social anthropology, they I think saw me as a more compatible kind of person since I had been to Ecuador and been to Guatemala. And I got the job. Four years later, the economy of Michigan, which is heavily dependent on the automobile industry, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, the whole industry was in recession. 200 people were given redundancy notices at just at Wayne State University, and mm -hmm. I was one of them. Oh, no. Now, the economy turned around, and maybe I could have stayed, but I had a mortgage. Mm -hmm. Only uh, we had just bought a house. I had two babies at home, two kids under five. You know, I, it was a very bad time for me when mm -hmm. I got that redundancy notice. And I started looking everywhere for jobs. I only had a move about 12 miles away to University of Michigan, Dearborn. Dearborn is right on the border of Detroit. So in 1982, I moved from Wayne State to University of Michigan. And I got that job again because of who I knew, not because of what I knew, turned out that one of my, ment my mentor, a professor at Wayne State's School of Medicine, Professor Gabriel Lasker, uh, had colleagues at Michigan and said, Bogan needs a job. What can you do for him? They said, well, there is a job at our Dearborn campus, which is a smaller undergraduate campus. Uh, he should apply. And I got a phone call saying, we have your curriculum vita. Would you please apply for the job? So it just all came together and I stayed at University of Michigan Dearborn for 25 years. Well, okay, good move then. <laughs> but UMD, UM, University of Michigan Dearborn, did not have graduate programs, just undergraduate programs mm -hmm. in anthropology. And I was looking for, to sort of finish out my career and train some uh, PhD students I received a message from a colleague at Loughborough saying, we have two jobs at Loughborough. Would you please tell some people that we have jobs? And one of them is for a more senior person. Um, I was already a professor in the United States. It was for a, um, a, a reader, which is kind of stepped down from professor. But I said, I'm looking for a job. So anyway, it all came together in 2007, January. I showed up in Loughborough. 
uh, I was, I, I, I took a kind of demotion, but I didn't think of it as a demotion to reader. And then 18 months later, I was prof professor again, promoted again. <laughs> and um, I got to train seven or eight PhD students. And then I retired in 2018. That's the story. And how did you find it? Because that's a big move from the US to Loughborough. Had you even heard of, other than the university, did you know much about Loughborough as a town? <laughs> I had been to the UK a few times. I had good colleagues at other universities. I had the colleague who contacted me at mm -hmm. Loughborough University, and I did know a couple of the other people ca very casually at Loughborough. Uh, so it, it y you know, um, anthropologists study culture. I thought the biggest problem would be, you know, talking to people on the street. Uh, you know, what I understand, I, I, I don't quite speak English, I speak American, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, no, I had no trouble adapting to the East Midlands British culture. There were a few words I didn't understand, you know, and the first time someone called me Miduck, I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know what what, I hope me dog. What am I you know, <laughs> doing? And I remember some, uh, uh, we had a garage added to our uh, house and a couple of lads from West Yorkshire came down to do the installation work. And when they spoke to each other, I couldn't understand a word they said. And when I, this was very soon after we arrived. And when I said, well, I asked about something. And they said, well, we'll do it at dinner time. Well, to an American dinner is your supper. Not the lunch. Okay. Right. So, wait a minute. You're not going to get this done until supper time. We got to do it now. <laughs> and they said, "We're going to do it right now. Don't worry. Supper. Uh, at, I mean dinner. We're going to do it. You know, as soon as we've had our dinner." I said, "Oh, okay. I understand." So it took a little bit. The biggest culture shock for me was the university. I thought universities all did mm -hmm. the same thing the same way. No. British universities and American universities do things quite differently. So I constantly was making errors and saying the wrong thing around the university. Nothing's too serious and, and most of it was funny, but uh, it took me a couple of years to figure out how UK universities work. <laughs> but what, what kind of differences? I'm curious, because I've, uh, yeah, I've never again, experienced again, a US. Just words. I, I, in the United States, I would teach classes. Here I teach modules. Got you. And it's a three-year program, not a four-year program. And in the United States, the first two years, um, most students do what's called taking uh, liberal arts courses, a variety of things. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, you get an extra year in high school if you're going on to university, and you just kind of do that first year in year 13 mm -hmm. in high school here, and then you begin to specialize right away. And, and uh, at first, that felt very... Um, bad to me, wrong. But now I understand how the system works, that it works differently. And um, one of the things that I'm still a, a little bit more concerned about is that in the United States, you know, we're all cowboys and cowgirls in, in our businesses, including the university. When I'm in my classroom in, in the United States, I'm really the one in charge and I can decide how the education proceeds. And in the UK and throughout most of the world, certainly the rest of Europe, it's much more um, by the book, a book that, that some other committee mm -hmm. has written. And I can't just change the rules. Whereas in the US mm -hmm. I have more, it, it's not that I'm cheating, but I can bend the rules a bit, a bit more. Uh, to the good of the students, I would think. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, if students did very poorly on a, an exam or a paper, I was allowed, in the US I could let them do it over again. Oh, okay. Here, Got you. I, here, I was very heavily criticized and told I can't do that because then I have to let every student do it. I said, well, I don't have to let the students who get, you know, A pluses do it again. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to train students. So the ones who totally missed the boat, it's not that they're stupid. It's just that they didn't understand mm. the requirements. Let them do it again and practice. I get to practice. I mean, mm. I get to do things over again when I submit a paper for publication. Some colleagues review it and they tell me you can do these things better. Why can't students? But it's it's not allowed at UK universities mm. to do it that yeah. way. You have to do it a different way. So it took me a while to learn those rules. But you're here now. You've learned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just before we move on, just a true test of how much you've grasped um, kind of the Midlands 
slang. Do you know mm. what a do you know what a jitty is? We have lots of jitties where I live. Yeah. Excellent. I'm yeah, of officially uh, honorary East Midlands are then. <laughs> yeah, although I knew that word from the United States, oh, uh, really? you know, the uh, town of Atlantic City where the Miss America pageant is. Um, they have little buses, little short buses that take you up and down the two main streets in Atlantic City, Atlantic Avenue and Pacific Avenue. If you play Monopoly, you'll know those streets. Uh, and uh, American Monopoly, that is, um, is based on Atlantic City streets. And uh, the, those little buses are called jitties. Oh, okay. Uh, they're, called, they're actually called jitneys. Some people call them jitties. So at first I said, where's the little bus? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It always seems to be the word that throws people. Jitty and the word Mardi. I'm assuming you've come across the word Mardi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's Mardi a... good day. <laughs> oh no. no we'll no. try and change that. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm fine. Okay. Um, so we've kind of discussed quite a journey in your kind of professional career. Yeah I'm, yeah. I'm sure you've got some kind of fun stories and standout moments to share with us. Can you uh, can you share a few, please? <sighs> well, you know, the whole thing has just been a tremendous a tremendous positive adventure. Of course, some things happened, like when I received the redundancy notice, mm. uh, you know, with babies at home and a mortgage. <laughs> that was not a good uh, few weeks, but I had good colleagues. You know, this, this mentor who took me under his wing for many years uh, really saved my life then. And um, what else really stands out? Oh, all my field work experiences really stand out. And, and the the... And, and now I can be a mentor to other people, both mm. students and some of my um, you know, younger colleagues. I'm still, whenever I can, I try to help them uh, to uh, improve their careers, um, offering advice or just being there to read their, their articles or, mm. or work or mm. just to talk to. And, and that, that's, those have been the standout things. The, the, working with all the people that I've worked with, especially the people in the field, some are colleagues, but also many are the people who graciously agree to participate in my research, allowing me to measure their children or whatever it is. <laughs> and, and, then, uh, and then the younger colleagues who, um, I don't try to pay back. I can't pay back my mentor. He's passed on, mm -hmm. but I can pay it forward. That's what I'm trying to do. So we've kind of touched on already, like the redundancy is probably one of the lower parts of your career yeah, that yeah, wasn't yeah. so great. Have you got any like s proper highs that you can tell us about where you're like, wow, this is, I can't believe I'm getting you know paid to do this. Yes. Well, my mentor, Professor Gabriel Lasker, he was born in the UK, by the way, but he came to the United States when he was very young. Um, uh, along the way, he um, began to edit a book series that is published by Cambridge University Press. And he came to me and he said, you know, no one has really written a book about human physical growth and development, height and weight and muscle and bones, from a purely anthropological perspective. All the books that were out there at the time, this is the early 1980s, were written primarily by medical doctors, pediatricians. And they, we just used them in anthropology, but they weren't really anthropological. They were about childhood diseases, more about normal growth and development, if I can use that word normal. So he says, why don't you think about that? And I wrote a book, it came out in 1988, called Patterns of Human Growth. The third edition was just published. <laughs> Here it is, Patterns of Human Growth. Those are three Indian girls there, different sizes and shapes, carrying water on their head which is a very nice image for this cover. The first cover had fetuses, <laughs> <laughs> drawings of fetuses. It's yeah. weird, that's, that's, that's very weird. So this just, came, this just was published by Cambridge University Press in late December, 2020. So take a look, Cambridge University Press, plug in the book. Yeah, my, and look, that look, book look came book. out in 1988. <laughs> when, the, when those books arrived, I opened them up. I just looked at them. And, you know, I have three children. I have many loved ones in my life. But when I saw that book, <laughs> I just picked up a copy and gave it a kiss. <laughs> and um, it really made a big difference 
to me yeah. you know, deep inside, but it made a difference in my career. That that book has become very well used by anthropologists and by other, you know, not, it's not used in medicine, it's used by mm. uh, sociologists, psychologists, um, anthropologists and others. And um, I think that was the biggest academic high that I yeah. had. The amount of people you probably helped on their academic journey with that book or inspired them, like that's pretty mind blowing. I, I can understand why you want well, to give that book a little kiss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> in academia, it's very important that when you take ideas from people, you give them credit. Mm -hmm. Because that's all we have. You want to steal my money? Go ahead, steal my money. That's not important. My ideas are important. What I see in other people's writing, almost word for word, things that I wrote in the previous two editions of the book, no credit to me. Mm. What that means, these aren't bad people, they're not stealing from me, they just have internalized it and they think that it's just the way the world is now. It's just, everybody mm. knows this. But when I published the first edition, there were many things in there that were not well known. There were a few mm. ideas I came up with that um, now, you know, students who had that book so many years ago, 35 years ago or more, they, they think that it's just the way the world is. So that, that's very um, satisfying to me to know that I've had some influence on. You've so. changed the game. <laughs> you changed it up. Well, I, I, I added a little bit, you know, and uh, Sir Isaac Newton said, if I've seen further than others because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Like that, so. I, I think that's a good line. I stand on. Let's um, let's discuss the ideas that you're referring to, because I think we yeah. have a question about that anyway. So now seems like an appropriate time. Um, so what were the ideas that kind of shook up the world a little bit at that time when you came out with them? Well, there were two themes in the first edition of the book, which are still in the third edition. Uh, and third edition is more than twice as thick. So... <laughs> We're moving along. Uh, there were two things. One, that human biological growth can be very strongly influenced by social and cultural processes. And today, the, the phrase I use, the words I use, is that human growth is influenced by social, emotional, let me put it in the right order, social, economic, political, and emotional factors. Social S, economic, E, political P, and emotional E. So SEPE is like the mm -hmm. acronym for the social, economic, political, and emotional. And all the time, these factors are working on us. They're working on us right now. You know, we're having a social interaction right here. There's economics involved, the obvious things, who's paying for all this technology that we're using and all this time. But economic systems go beyond just money into how resources are distributed in a society. Some societies, I would say the world, the way it is today, a few people get a lot. For instance, I work in Guatemala, 18 million people in Guatemala, 18 million in a small country. That Guatemala is in Central America, just next to Mexico, 18 million people, 260 of them, 260 out of 18 million control 50% of all the wealth in that country. Wow, it is. That's not my numbers. Mm. That comes from, mm. from, you know, international bankers and stuff like that. So that's a very unequal society. And, they, and, the, and the whole society pays the price. I'm, I'm, I've just submitted an article for publication called Fear, Violence, inequality and stunting in Guatemala. Stunting is very, very short stature for age. And Guatemala is the one country in the Americas that has the most stunted children. These are kids from birth to five years of age who are at the very bottom, bottom, bottom of the, the, the range of height. And, and, and that's bad for them. Everybody agrees it's bad. Most people think that when they're that short, it's because they're not eating or they're very ill. Mm -hmm. But we have studied kids in Guatemala, in Mexico, in the United States, in Indonesia, in South Africa. These are countries where I've worked and who are not malnourished and don't have infectious diseases or other kinds of diseases, but they're still very, very short. And the real kicker is that in Guatemala, 17% of the newborn to five-year-olds 
zero to five year olds, 17% from the richest families are stunted. This, sh this should be, you know, like 1% for medical reasons or, or just, just because you're very short. But 17% in other poor countries, uh, up, uh, uh, Pakistan, for instance, uh, 20 some percent are stunted. That can't be because of nutrition or poor health. It's because of those other factors. It's because of the economic inequalities and the social inequalities and also the emotion. So in this article, I talk about the fact that in Guatemala, everybody lives in fear. Guatemala has, I think it's the 12th highest murder rate of all nations in the world. This is murders per 100,000 people mm. in the population. It's the third highest murder rate for women. And that goes across all mm. economic categories. And out of every 100 murders, only one ever even gets to court. Wow. Which mm. means murderers get away with it. Mm. So people send their kids, the rich send their kids to school in bulletproof automobiles with armed guards. Most of the rich kids' schools, you have to drive through a fence, be you know scanned in order to get in. It wasn't like that when I went to Guatemala in the 70s. You could walk around. Mm. It was still a violent place, but it wasn't so violent. Anyway, you live with that kind of fear. That fear gets internalized. This is how society, social, economic, political factors get internalized into stress hormones. The kind of, you know, you're crossing the street, the bus is coming right at you, you're gonna have stress hormones. But what if you have high levels of stress hormones every day because you live in fear? Well, what we have found in the last about five years, this is not my research, but what other biologists have discovered is that these stress hormones get into the body and actually stop bones from growing. It causes bones to excrete more bone material than build up, and that slows the rate of kids' growth. And, and can that be passed on once that's happened as well? Can it be passed on by like epigenetics and stuff like that? Because I know kids yes. can inherit mental health problems from their parents through epigenetics. So I'm assuming it just keeps going. Yes. Uh, just for your audience, ep epigenetics means it, it, it affects the way the genes are expressed but it's not the genes themselves. It's chemical factors that are on the DNA or the RNA. Everybody should be an expert in RNA now with COVID <laughs> vaccines, which are based on the RNA. Anyway, it gets, it gets, these, these are factors. Sometimes they come from the foods we eat. Sometimes they come from uh, pollutants in the atmosphere, other chemicals. They get into our genetic machinery and it either turns on or turns off genes. So you have the genes. You and I both have the gene for something good, but mine gets turned off because of something that happens to me. Well, these stress hormones work as epigenetic factors and turn off, mm -hmm. turn off the bone. Well, actually it turns up the genes for certain hormones in the body that cause the bones to, the, the skeleton to leach away bone material and slows bone growth. At the same time, it actually causes more fat to develop in the body. So the kids end up very short, but plump. And that's what we're seeing around the world these days. In, in places where people are very short, they're getting fatter. Um, I think it's due to stress. And would you argue that if you took the kids out of that situation and put them into like a safe home environment, you'd expect to see yes. any changes? Yeah, okay. Well, in Guatemala, there are two major ethnic groups. There are the native indigenous people who call themselves and are called the Maya. About half the country, maybe a little more, in Guatemala are ethnically Maya. They speak Maya languages, practice Maya religion, um, things like that. The other half are a sort of a combination of Spanish and Maya, but who identify, don't identify as Maya. They identify more with uh, the, their Spanish precursors. The Spanish arrived, you know, in the year 1500, conquered the Maya with their guns and especially with their germs. Uh, there were about 20 million people in the 
Central America, North America region in 1500. A hundred years later, in 1600, we were over 2 million. 90% died mostly from infectious diseases, measles, smallpox, and European bubonic plague, which did not exist in the Americas, and they just wiped them out. Anyway, those populations have come back. So today, about 50-50, Maya and the non-Maya, who call themselves Ladinos. In Guatemala, the Maya are often the lowest of the low, socially, economically, and politically. The shortest people in Guatemala are the Maya. Maya women have not increased in height. They're very, when I say short, I mean under five feet tall for most Maya women. And they have not increased in height since we've been measuring heights in Guatemala. That's more than 100 years, 1896. So things have not gotten better for them. It's impossible to find wealthy, healthy, well-nourished, great, you know, well-educated Maya in Guatemala. In 1991, I was minding my own business in Michigan, and a colleague showed me a story in the New York Times newspaper that seven Maya men were killed in a traffic accident in Florida. And the article talked about the fact that there were a few thousand Maya people in Florida. They had migrated up from Guatemala, mm -hmm. mostly due to warfare and terrible living conditions in Guatemala, and they had spread across the United States in the migrant labor streams, and they mostly were farm workers, and they were in Florida picking oranges and grapefruits and lemons in the citrus region in, in central southern Florida. And they mentioned one man, one Maya man, who talked a little bit about the community. So it was kind of a human interest story in the paper about these seven men who were in a traffic accident, all Maya men, but it was also about the problems that brought the Maya to the United States. I eventually was able to make contact with this Maya man, and uh, we started talking. I explained what I wanted to do. I wanted to measure Maya kids in the United States to show how much bigger and healthier they would be in the United States. So he was sympathetic to that. It turned out he was working at a, um, a religious school, a private school, but that gave places to very poor children in central Florida. And most of them happened to be Maya at that time. So in 1992, I went down there and I measured a couple hundred kids, both at this school and also at the state school in this small town, it's called Indian Town, Florida, not named after the Maya Indians. Uh, named after Seminole Indians, who were the native people of Central Florida, who got all wiped out by Europeans hundreds of years ago. <laughs> anyway, I measured them, and they were already three inches taller, even though wow. most of them had been born in Guatemala. Three inches taller than same age, same sex kids back in Guatemala. And then I went back in 2000, and I also went to Los Angeles. Some other people found out, another anthropologist named James Lauke found out about my work. He was working with Maya in Los Angeles. Anyway, in, in 1999-2000, we measured about 700 kids altogether between Florida and Los Angeles, and they were already five inches taller than the Maya. And some of those kids had been born in Guatemala. Most had been born in the United States. And we almost did a minute-by-minute -minute analysis. The longer they were in the United States, the taller they were. Wow. It was amazing. It was the biggest increase in height ever measured in that short a period of time. Basically one generation. So it can't be genetic because genes don't change between parents and children. And all these kids had Maya parents. We, we, you know, we had to get permission from the parents to measure their kids. All of them had Maya parents. Um, they were like normal, good old American kids, like my kids. They didn't speak, most of them, you know, spoke English. They were bad at Spanish. I, my Spanish was better and my Spanish is so good. And, and uh, they just didn't know this stuff. They grew up without the fear. I think that is the major. I think if anybody had any doubts about whether we have more to learn about human development, you've just answered it there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, I didn't understand this fully until about 2000 yeah. and, you know, the book, plug the book, plug the book. The book with Sepe <laughs> in it just came out last year, so it took me 20 years to wrap my head around it. Mm. So we still have more to learn. So we've started, well, we've discussed your kind of earlier research. Let's now move on to talking about ongoing research and some of kind of the more 
in recent years, the research you've done. Um, so could you tell us some of the other projects you've done around the evolution of the pattern of growth? Um, and I know you've done it in lots of different areas around the world as well, so it'd just be great to get an overview of some of that research. Well, yeah, uh, most of, uh, of this was based on um, interpreting the information published by other people, the people who discovered fossils and the people who work in the field with chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas. Um, I'm so thankful to those people for their dedication. Uh, lots of times they publish the data or produce the data and make films so I can watch these animals behave myself. I've, I've tried to work on the interpretation of those data. So um, rather than the, the raw thing, but as I just mentioned, I have been able to work directly with a couple of fossils uh, where I was given the, the, um, the raw data, so to speak, and told to, to work with a group of people to interpret it. So uh, I have worked with these uh, South African fossils a little bit. I'm not working with them just now but I have worked with them a little bit. And what, what really happened in the last uh, 20, 25 years, since I and some others have, people have been writing about the evolution of human growth, is that the fossil hunters have become more interested in finding immature fossils. Back when I was a student, you know, back in the 50s, well, 60s, 70s, uh, it was great to find an adult skull or body, that, that's what made the newspapers. If you found the babies, they were so incomplete and so mm. fragile, that wasn't so exciting. But now people are focusing really on the babies. So we find what we're looking for, usually, in science. We find what we're looking for, we're attuned to how our theory, how our, you know, our, our model of the world affects um, what we're looking for, and then we find it. And so since I started writing about this, theoretically, dozens of immature fossils have been discovered. They were out there before, but they just weren't being paid much attention. And now we're studying and analyzing those fossils. I work with um, indirectly with a group in Spain that is looking at young Neanderthals, lots of Neanderthals in Europe, especially in Spain, in northern Spain. Uh, and uh, I helped consult on uh, a study of a juvenile Neanderthal, probably was about seven years old when he died. Neanderthals, even though they're very like us in many ways, just didn't have quite the full human pattern of growth. They probably grew up faster than we do and didn't have an adolescence. Mm. So uh, I'm still working with some of those people. We, we talk about the research and, um, and I'm still writing about this and reinterpreting uh, some of the things I've said in the past and what other people are um, reinterpreting the fossil evidence as new evidence is found. Um, more recently, I've been working on this uh, SEPE, the social, economic, political, and emotional impacts on growth in, in living people in various parts of the world. So uh, like I said, I have one article now, I just submitted, I just sent it in yesterday about fear and violence and failure to grow in Guatemala. I've worked with a couple of German colleagues on a few papers about uh, these kinds of problems in Indonesia, and especially how uh, nutrition does not explain the very short stature of people who live in fear and live in poverty. I've worked with a few other colleagues, including Lufbra colleagues like Professor Paula uh, Griffiths uh, and our previous, our, our one of our PhD students is now uh, working in Myanmar, of all places, on um, health and nutrition projects. We reviewed, we reviewed all the data available about nutrition interventions for low-income people in, in um, low-income nations in urban areas. We did a, what's called a systematic review. And we, we, we looked at all these nutritional interventions where people sprinkled some vitamin A or some other vitamins, B vitamins, or did some nutrition education or improved the sanitation of people living in slums in Africa, in Latin America, in India. Most of the studies, in fact, have been done in India and Bangladesh. We found almost no effect on height. This is 
improving nutritional status or hygiene? Does it improve the height of kids between birth and five years of age? There's All right. no improvement. It's not because the people didn't do it right or they're mean or they're bad. Hmm. It's because they improved nutrition, but they didn't improve the economic, the emotional, mm -hmm. and the political conditions, which the people can't do anything about that. Those conditions come from what we call upstream political and economic systems, the people in charge. I'm mm. not going to get into all the politics of, <laughs> of Africa and India and Bangladesh. There are very good people upstream who are in trying to make life better, but there's a tremendous divide between the haves and the have-nots. And unfortunately, most people live in fear, with violence, warfare, kidnappings, all that sort of stuff, and especially just insecurities. Mothers don't know if they're going to have enough money to feed all the family by the end of the month. They don't know if what they're going to do if someone becomes ill. It's not the becoming ill, and it's not the food. It's the fear of the insecurity. Mm. It's into the mother's body, and the babies are already born small. In India, in Bangladesh, in Guatemala, the babies are already born small. So if you start out small and things don't get better after birth, you're going to stay small. That leads us nicely on to our next uh, bit of research we're going to discuss. So we wrote, recently worked together about um, the size of babies born as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and you have made a prediction that you think that the babies will be smaller because of um, the kind of this, the stress that you've been talking yeah. about. And I think it's important that we flag here that we're talking about chronic stress, not a bit of a, a panic around, oh, you know, it's really hot outside today. I'm really stressed about going out and I need to take X, Y, Z. Yeah. It's chronic stress, which is quite yeah. a bit different. Um, so could you tell me a bit about the predictions that you've made around the COVID-19 babies that are to be born um, and if you could explain how this links to I know you looked at the if I'm right I'm thinking was it the Spanish financial yeah. crisis if you could just tell us a bit about that and those predictions that would be great thank you yeah well COVID has stressed us all doesn't matter how wealthy you are how poor you are although of course poor people suffer more uh, but everybody is stressed we can't travel we can't see loved ones so that's the emotional mm. social um, the economy is, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with the economy. National debt is at the all-time highs. For some people, personal debt may be at all-time highs. So this is the kind of chronic stress that you were talking about. And we studied this in Spain in the run-up to the 2008 financial pandemic, where all banks all over the world were failing. Governments had to bail out banks. Um, Unemployment reached all-time highs in those places, and I worked with a few Spanish colleagues because they had access to 100% of all the registered births in Spain since the year ooh, either 2000 or 1999, somewhere back there. And we plotted all these, we plotted the birth weights. That's on the birth certificate of all registered births, which in Spain is, you know, more than 99% of all births. And birth weights were actually going up from about 1999 to for, for several years. And then it started to level off and started to go down and dropped a lot after 2008. Economic conditions were already getting bad after about 2003, 2004. Economies were contracting. I know I was in Michigan until 2007. In 2005, 2006, Big businesses were failing in Michigan because the automobile industry was contracting and they were laying off people. And uh, this was especially in the upper income areas, upper income furniture shops, clothing shops were just closing up because their clientele were moving away. They, were, they, they no longer were employed by the big three auto companies. They were moving elsewhere to other parts of the country or, I don't, or, or retiring and they just cut back. So one reason I left, I was already looking for a job out of Michigan because things were getting tight there. But imagine the people who were losing their jobs. That leads to chronic stress. 
And what we noticed was a drop in birth weight. Now this was in Spain, but it's been noted in other countries in Europe and other countries in the world in that same time period leading up to the 2008 financial disaster when banks were closing and the stock market collapsed, we noticed a drop in birth weight. And this is across all social economic groups in Spain. Some of the rich people didn't have any money problems, but they lived with day-to-day -day insecurity. What was gonna happen next? The government was cutting back on all kinds of programs and their companies were cutting back. The only group that didn't have a drop in birth weight it's a very small group of women having babies, university students. That's because in Spain, if you're a university student, you have an almost guaranteed day-to-day -day routine and money. Most students are getting some kind of support from the government. So the very few, and it was a very small mm. part of the total sample, very small number of these university women who were having babies, they didn't show a drop in birth weight. And our explanation is, well, they didn't really feel the... Mm the day-to-day -day stress, but everybody else, and it was most severe, of course, in the poorest, least well-educated segments of Spain, who were most vulnerable to losing their jobs. So, with COVID-19, everybody is feeling stress for one reason or another. Not necessarily money, but just some kind of stress. Lack of love is a stress, you know, lack of human contact. So, um, I can't say for sure, but I predict that we'll be able to detect some slight decrease in birth weight across all the groups in, in the UK and the United States. It's gonna take you know a, a year or so or two years for all the data to be collected and analyzed, but it's, it's, a, it's a prediction. I'd be happy to be wrong. It's not gonna be a huge drop, but, hmm. uh, but you know, even 10 grams in average birth weight, a very small amount is still biologically important. We'll have to watch how that one progresses and uh, see if your predictions exactly. are right or not. Exactly. Um, so the final bit of research I want to talk to you about before we move on um, is listed on your academic profile. It says the use of relative leg length as an indicator of healthy growth. So I've always had very short legs and a long torso. Is this good or bad? <laughs> well, <laughs> I can make a bad joke, you know, like I, I measure you to, but no, you're right. You're right. First thing is you and I and every individual listening to this or viewing this podcast, um, we all come, we all have our individual sizes and shapes and there's a tremendous range of what is normal. So um, that you have what you feel our legs you would like your legs to be longer relative to your torso that just may be your family background biological background genetic mm -hmm. background. and it's perfectly normal it's perfectly healthy but when we look at hundreds or thousands of people and we measure total height and we measure usually we don't measure legs it's kind of a little bit hard to measure legs but what we can do is measure you sitting down so if i you know have you sit down and measure from the table I'm sitting on to the top of my head, we call that a sitting height. And then we subtract that from your total height, we get some idea how long your legs are. So that gives us a body proportion. Mm -hmm. When we measure hundreds or thousands of boys and girls, and we find, for instance, the Maya in Guatemala are not just short, but very short legs, we know that they have suffered because the legs grow the fastest when you're born, when a baby is born. You have to look at some very newborn baby pictures, which most people think baby newborn babies are really weird. They're aliens. They have this big <laughs> head, which is about 25% of their total length, right? <laughs> so if they're 50 centimeters long at birth, 21 inches. Imagine 25% of that. And their arms and legs are very short. And actually, we, we kind of think those little clumsy movements of babies are kind of cute. But between birth and nine years of age, the arms and legs grow their fastest. But if something bad happens to you, bad nutrition, bad disease, you're not loved, you or your family are chronically stressed, that slows the growth of the parts that are growing the fastest. And that's the arms and legs, especially the legs. So if you get to be nine years of age and you're not just short, but very short legged, and everyone in your community is like that, we know bad things have happened to you in those first nine years. 
And that's what the Maya actually look like in Guatemala. Okay. Remember way back at the beginning, I said that mm -hmm. the Maya in Florida and Los Angeles, they were five centimeters, uh, excuse me, 10 centimeters, five inches taller. 70% of that increase in height. So like three and a half, uh, no, five inches, yeah, three and a half to four inches, these legs. Wow. Not head and body, yeah. legs. Because now some bad things are still happening to them. Like I said, they're still poor and they're still stressed. But just having the lack of fear that they found mm. in Guatemala, we see the legs sprout like plants that have just gotten you know, watered in sun. And um, they, they, they don't end up super tall as adults. They're just taller. They come up closer to average height by growing the extra five inches total and extra three and a half in the legs. Mm -hmm. And they don't look as, you know, sort of disproportionate mm -hmm. by the time I see them as nine-year-olds. Now your title at Loughborough University is Emeritus Professor. For somebody that's not in Haiti, could you explain what that means, please? It's very simple. It means I don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> it means I, I, I'm technically retired. I'm a pensioner. The university doesn't pay me, but I still am part of the Loughborough family. I still have access to the internet and things like that through Loughborough. <laughs> I still put Loughborough University on my research publications and outputs, and I uh, am happy to represent the university uh, in this podcast and stuff like that. <laughs> so Loughborough likes you so much, we've let you stay part of our family with the official title. Yes, it's a kind of yeah. honorific that you yeah. know after you're no longer on active duty. Cool. And um, you still teach from time to time. Okay. Oh, um, so we've discussed a lot in this podcast which is wonderful what would you say if you had to pinpoint one thing is the most exciting part about being a biological anthropologist obviously talking to you is the best yeah, thing. this is a career highlight that's happened but there's no one thing i thought about that a lot in in my career and there's there's no one thing it's it's been the whole trip including the highs and the lows the frustrations when I did get, you know, things mm -hmm. published or didn't, or did get support for my research or didn't, it's still, everything helped bring me along and, um, you know, maybe stronger. <laughs> and uh, so I'm just, I'm just so thankful that I was able to do this in my lifetime. That I was able to do something that, that wasn't a job. Yes, and I got paid for it. It was mm -hmm. something I wanted to do. I wanted to turn over rocks, see what was under there, and find out why they were there and what they were doing. And I've been doing that since I was five years old. <laughs> so what's the weirdest thing you've had to do as part of your job? You no. Know, the weirdest thing, it still gets me today. <laughs> but you know, people say, I'm, I'm at a party, not, not an academic party, but something else. And what do you do? I'm an anthropologist. And you know, First people, some people will say, oh, you dig up, you know, old bones. Well, not really. Mm -hmm. I really work with the living. Oh, anthropologists work with the living. You know, but the, the weird part becomes when I say, like, I work in Guatemala with the Maya. Oh, the Maya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen those Maya pyramids. And, you know, they did, the Maya people who are alive today didn't build them. I said, what do you mean? Oh, they, they had to get help. The ancient Maya, they either got help from extraterrestrials <laughs> Well, there's lots of films on that. Yeah, yeah. Those. Or the Maya, the Maya didn't build those. An ancient group of people, nice people, big, healthy people built them because the Maya are so small. They couldn't have built those pyramids. Same with the Egyptians, same with North American native people. It was this ancient group of people. And then these Native Americans came along and killed them all and <laughs> stole their pyramids from them. I said, where are you getting this? And, and what I understand <laughs> is that they really, it, it's weird. It's weird because in this day and age, you would think that we would have learned that all people have the mental capacity and the physical capacity to do these things, that ancient Egyptians did build the pyramids, ancient Maya did build the you know, they had the money, they had, they had the, the, 
human power. They had the motivation to do this. We know how they did it. Um, but people still have these very old fashioned attitudes mm. other people because they don't want to accept the Maya as fully human. So mm. I find that weird that even today, there's still this stuff that sells all these alien you know built the pyramids shows on tv i don't know who that is appealing to I don't know. <laughs> well hopefully a podcast like this will help dispel some of those myths we're hearing it here from you i hope you don't get hate Stop it. Alien. <laughs> let's hope not <laughs> But they do say once you start getting hate mail, that's when you've really made it. So maybe exactly. that's when we're out there as a, exactly. <laughs> a great podcast. No, please don't send me hate mail. I will cry. Um, <laughs> so moving on, uh, what is your, have you got a career goal in mind or a dream for your career? Because you've achieved so much. You've got the book, you've done so much field work. Yeah. Is there anything you're looking towards? You're like, right, I want to do this. I think you always have to have something in mind, even if you never do it. I do have an idea about a project to look at kind of the last 100,000 years or so of human evolution in okay. parts of Spain and Portugal and North Africa, because there was a lot of intercommunication between there and a lot of interesting um, technological advancements there. Um, uh, it may take me to other parts of the world as well, but it's an idea. I, I, I have some experience in Spain and in Portugal, not in North Africa, but but. Uh, those areas had a lot of communication and, and their, their ecology, the weather and the, 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 the plants and animals are more similar than you might think, even in North Africa. Um, so certain plants and trees mm. are, own, are, are found in more um, frequency there than other parts of the world. And it's affected the way some people live. So I have an idea. Uh, of course, COVID has to be over so I can travel to mm. the south of Portugal and live for a while there that's also part of the plan go to a nice warm <laughs> yeah don't blame you <laughs> spain things like that so we'll see we'll see definitely one of the perks of the jobs traveling i, su I assume nation here in the uk that will support emeritus professors to to take a year off and work on a new project so I'm, i might ask them for some help some support <laughs> i don't know if you missed that question but i just said is it definitely one of the perks of the job being able oh, yes. to travel yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm missing travel a lot to mm. conferences and for research and, and of course to see my family i still have a lot mm. of family in the united states what's the best place you've been to as part of field work i lived in guatemala for two mm. years when i was a postgrad student and okay. then for months at a time afterwards i, I would say guatemala is the despite all the problems mm. there, still it's one of my favorite places in the world. It's a, most people are beautiful and the place is physically beautiful with the, with the mountain ranges, the volcanoes, the lakes. It's like the Switzerland of Central America. And uh, it's just a lovely place. And the food. So what areas do you think will be the hot topic for the next generation of biological anthropologists? Obviously we've touched on COVID-19, it'll be interesting to see what comes of that in future years, but are there any other areas that you think will be, you know, need to be explored? Well, in fact, the whole area of the study of how stress, social, economic, political stress influences human biology has just, you know, mushroomed in, in, in interest, and activity in the last five years. Um, and I'm a little late to the game actually in it, but I go to the conferences and meetings and I saw the young people talking about this research on stress during pregnancy and stress uh, in adolescence and things like that. And I said, oh man, that applies to what I do. And, and so I finally caught up, but I think that's still a very hot area. All of these social biological interactions, I think are where it's at. And even though I <laughs> didn't like math when I was younger, uh, applying um, newer mathematical techniques like network analysis to social and biological behavior, it's, it's being done, it's been done for some time, but I think there's a lot of um, more to do in the biomathematical interactions. Mm -hmm. using math to understand our biology 
is, is still a very hot area. So I urge students to pay attention to their math. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I wish I could predict, I mean, these are things that are already happening, but I think we'll have lots of room to grow. I don't know what the next really new hot area is. If I did, I would have invested in that company <laughs> 20 years ago and I'd be on my yacht right now. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously there's more interest in extraterrestrial activities, with the Mars rover landing mm -hmm. and eventual human missions to Mars and other places. And it's going to take some anthropologists to get that done because mm -hmm. of all those social, economic, political, and emotional and biological factors that uh, space flight will require. And I could it could you argue as well that obviously when we get to the point that we're putting humans on uh, you know Mars or whatever, will anthropologists be needed then to study the human development on these different areas? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And should we find any evidence of life? And it doesn't have to be, you know, take me to your leader kind yeah, of yeah. <laughs> any kind of life. That's going to change the whole game. Mm -hmm. And how's that going to affect human biology? If we're not alone in the in this universe of the galaxy, what what does that mean for our place here on this planet? And that's going to need an anthropologist to help, as well as a lot of other people. So you've already provided a few words of wisdom um, for kind of students thinking about going into this kind of research area. Um, I was wondering if you have any more advice for people aspiring to be in a position like you are or words that you wish you told your younger self before going on this ac ac academic journey. Well, of course, you have to be serious about what you're interested in, but you have to be interested in something that stirs your soul. Mm -hmm. So even if other people tell you you can't do that, like my high school guidance counselor said, I, you can't become an archaeologist or whatever. Or your parents or significant others say, no, you got to think about, you know, a livelihood. That'll all come if you follow your heart. That's number one. A couple of times in my life, I didn't follow my heart and I was the worst for it. Number two is while you follow your heart, you have to be good to other people. Because you need other people both on the way up and on the way down. <laughs> so, so you have to be kind. Science is a highly social activity, and we can't forget that a little bit of kindness goes very far in our social lives. And everybody needs a good mentor. If somebody becomes interested in you, don't push them away. Take what they can give you. I didn't appreciate the value of a good mentor until I was, you know, already in my first job. I kind of pushed away some of my you know, professors when I was a, a postgrad student, because I, I, I've always had this attitude, I can do it myself, <laughs> just to prove myself, not because I didn't like them, I just wanted to prove myself. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have done that. I should have, I should have taken more from them, really. They wanted to give and I should have taken more. So when I finally got a good mentor and, and, a, and allowed that person to help me, that supercharged my, my career. And then be a good mentor too when it's your turn. That's a common theme we've had through these podcasts about the importance of mentorship. So yeah, I think it's really, really good advice. And I know from speaking to people like you, I've started as a student to reach out to the professors that inspire me because I'm like, take me under your wing, <laughs> teach me everything you can, yes. you know, because yes. I think that, you know, it's key, isn't it? About who you know and absorbing the knowledge of other people that are in positions that you want to be in in the future. So excellent advice um so before we go is there anything you wish to plug what else to plug now just um check out the book i suppose if people yeah, are you know feel inspired by this it's got everything you need. and an ebook and i'm happy to answer people's questions if they want to get in touch with me easy to find my email mm -hmm. online uh through Loughborough university so you can get in touch with me and uh happy to um to talk to you especially if you want you're thinking about anthropology fantastic well thank you so much for taking the time to have a cup of tea with us today it's been absolutely fascinating to hear about your research and uh, yeah a real a real pleasure yeah, thank you thank you you're welcome it's been a lot of fun for me as well thank you so much Mike. thank you all for listening or watching this episode of couple with a scientist we hope you found it interesting and will join us again do leave a comment and get in touch. I'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts on who you'd like to see on the show. 
And make sure you don't miss her show by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other mainstream podcast platforms. You can also subscribe to the Loughborough University YouTube channel if you prefer to watch the show. See you next time for more hot tea and even hotter stories to help you on your way to becoming a scientist. Cheers.